few space invaders. In my last video, we went over how to build the necessary functions needed to perform a least squares fit of a Gaussian profile to the emission lines in a galaxy spectrum. In that video, we wrote each function and tested them individually, and then tested the entire code on a simulated galaxy spectrum that we created ourselves. In this video, we're going to use those same functions, um, but this time we're going to test them on an actual galaxy spectrum which I've downloaded from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or SDSS data archives. The exact spectrum that I'm using in this video belongs to an emission line galaxy um, known as a green pea, which is a rapidly star forming galaxy. Um, the redshift of this galaxy, which I'm not going to tell you right now, but we'll get to later, has caused the forbidden oxygen three emission line in this galaxy spectrum to be shifted such that when it is observed by the SDSS telescopes, it appears bright green in their filters. The SDSS archive data for this galaxy can be found by clicking the link that I've provided in the description section of this video. The link takes you to a profile of the source, and in this profile, it contains a composite image of the source here. And in that image, you can see what I mean by the, the galaxy appears bright, bright green through the SDSS filters. The profile also has spectroscopic information down here at the bottom. So if you, you can actually like click on this spectrum and look at these in detail. If you go to the left hand side where it says spec summary and then go down to FITS, this will take you to where you can actually download the FITS file that contains the spectroscopic information for this source. So here you can click download. I just click download and it automatically downloaded to my download fo folder on my Mac. Um, but they do note that some people have trouble with that, so you might need to right-click, download, and save it to a specific directory. Just do whatever's correct for your system. Okay, so once you download the FITS file, you should move it to the directory where the Python notebook or Python code that you're working on is located, and then make sure to take note of the file name because we're going to need that to read in the file. Okay, so going back to our notebook, all of this stuff is basically just what we went over in the last tutorial, building the functions and then testing each one. So if you don't have all of this in your notebook, make sure to go through that tutorial first before moving on to this one. Okay, so now that our data is set up in the correct de directory and we've taken note of the name, we can try using the fitting functions that we've written to fit Gaussian profiles to the spectrum that we just downloaded. So let's read in the SDSS spectrum first. To do this, we're going to be using the astropy.io fits package. And then we're also going to plot the spectrum afterwards using the matplotlib pyplot package, which should already be imported into your notebook. So let's import from astropy.io import fits, and then shift enter to execute that cell. Okay, and so to actually import the file, we're going to use our, we're going to put it into a header data unit list or HDUL. And to do that, we're going to use the fits.open command. And then you just give it the name of the file that's in that directory. And so, like I said, it starts with spec something. I'm just going to type spec and then autocomplete. So another thing to note is that the extensions under FITS files can come in many different formats, but the one that we've just downloaded specifically is a table, and it's a table that has the flux and wavelength information contained in it. If you have some kind of software on your computer that's capable of reading and displaying information from FITS files, that's a great way to open up this file and see what the different columns are in the table and actually read the column names off of the table. If you don't have a software like that, I'll, I'll leave a link to one that I recommend I use all the time, but you can also just read that information from the file with Python. So to do that, we're actually going to print the column information for this HDL. So it's gonna be all of the spectral information is in the first extension, or the index one extension, which is technically the second extension. And then we're just going to print the columns. And this will tell us just what each column is that has information for us in this file. And so the ones that we're interested in are the wavelength and flux. 
So the flux one is easily named flux, and the wavelength column is named log lamb, which tells us that the data values are likely in a log format. So we'll have to deal with that when we get there. Okay, so now that we know the column information, we can read these columns into variables. For the flux data, I'm just going to call it spec, and spec is getting information from the HDL index one extension. Then we want to go to the data portion of that extension and read in flux. And then we're also going to read in the wavelengths. I'll just call those waves. And again, it's under the same extension in the data portion, but we called it, it's called log lamb. And like I said, these are likely in log format, so we need to unlog them by doing 10 raised to the values in that column. Okay, so now we can plot the spectrum and see what it looks like. So we'll do plt.plot. Waves is our x-axis and spec is the y. plt.show to render our plot. Okay, so that's the spectrum. It looks pretty small. It's kind of hard to see when it's squished in this way. To help with this, we can change the size of the figure that's being plotted here to make it bigger. So to do this, first we need to create a figure. So fig is going to be plt.figure to initialize the figure. And then we can set the size of it or the dimensions with fig set size in inches. And I made it like 25 by 10. And then once again, plt plot the same thing we did in the previous cell. Waves. Okay, that's much easier to see the entire spectrum and see individual emission lines. So there are many emission lines that we can see in the spectrum. Some of them such as like oxygen 2, some hydrogen bomber emission lines like H gamma, H beta, H alpha, um, and some forbidden lines such as oxygen 3, the doublet, and nitrogen 2, the doublet, and also the sulfur 2 doublet. Recall that the whole point of this tutorial was to determine the shifted center of a pair of emission lines. Um, and the pair of emission lines that's best suited for this in this spectrum is going to be the forbidden oxygen 3 doublet here in the center. And that's because these two lines are very strong, one, and also well separated, or at least not blended together. So it'll be easy to fit um, two separate Gaussians to them. So the oxygen 3 doublet lines in the rest frame fall at 49.59 approximately and 5007 approximately. Okay, so um, remember that our fit data function that we created before takes a wavelength axis, a flux axis for the spectrum. So to make things easier, we're going to want to crop the spectrum that we've just displayed such that we're only passing those two emission lines so that it's not confusing the, the fitting function just to make it easier for the function. So from the plotted spectrum, it looks like the oxygen 3 doublet is between about 6,000 and 7,000. So let's zoom in on that part of the spectrum to try and refine what we're passing the function. So to do that, I like to use the numpy where function. This allows you to pass it conditions that pertain to a certain array and then it'll tell you which indices in that array meet the condition that you've specified. So specifically, we want data corresponding to wavelengths between 6,000 and 7,000. So I'm going to do, I'll, I'll call the indices array sub i, and so we're going to call numpy where, and we want to know where the waves are greater than 6,000 and where the waves are less than 7,000. Okay, and then, so we're gonna get from this a subspectrum that's going to be the spectrum only at those specific sub-i indices, and then a sub-wavelength array that is, again, only at those specified indices, sub-i. Okay, so now we'll plot again our, our subset of the spectrum. I'm just going to use the same figure setup and then change this to sub wave and sub spec. Okay. So 
So in the zoomed in view that we have right now, it looks like the doublet in a more refined sense is in between approximately 6450 and 6600. So we can basically just copy the cell and redo that zoom in on those uh, more refined numbers. So what did I say? 6450 and 6600. And then again, plot that. Okay, and that's much more refined. Only two emission lines are in that subspectrum. So hopefully our fitting function should not have a problem with that at all. In addition to the wavelength and uh, flux array, we'll also need to provide initial guesses for the fit parameters. One parameter that we can make a good guess on is the approximate location of the emission lines. Instead of trying to read these off of a figure by eye, we can detect their locations more accurately by using another Python function that we can import. So since the emission lines appear like peaks in the spectrum, we can use the scipy find peaks function to get an idea of their locations. And it looks like both lines are about at least taller than 35 flux units. So we'll use 35 flux units as our cutoff. And so we'll say that the spec peaks are going to be located by the signal dot find peaks. And we'll pass that the sub spec and then give it a height cutoff of 35. And let's just print what that gives us in terms of the wavelengths. So it's sub waves or sub wave. And then we want to look at the location of the spec peaks. And oh, it looks like I did not import the scipy signal function yet. Um, I believe I imported it in the previous. Oh no, I didn't even do that. Okay. So let's go back up here to where we imported things and let's import sci-fi.signal and then we'll just need to add sci-fi here ah yes okay so the reason this is giving me an error is because the um, array of indices passed by spec or passed back to spec peaks is embedded inside of another array. So we need to index into that outer array for some reason. And then this should allow us, yes, to actually use the indices in there. Okay, so we can use these. It looks like it said the first one is a, about 6495, which Looks good. And then 6558. Um, I think that's pretty accurate. So we can use these estimates as initial guesses for our fitting function. So let's try our function out. Our, remember, our fitting function is called fit data. Remember that fit data returns two things it returns the optimal parameters, POF2, and also the covariance of those optimal parameters. And so we'll read those out of fit data. Okay, and then remember that fit data wants you to pass it the wavelength array, the spectrum, and then initial guesses for all the parameters that you are trying to fit. So we call this sub wave was our wavelength array, sub spec was the spectrum array, and then for our initial guesses, so to me the amplitudes look like they're about 40 and 120, Obviously, these won't be the actual amplitudes returned by the fit, because remember from our equation for a Gaussian that the actual value of the Gaussian at a certain point, or at least at the peak, is the amplitude divided by the standard deviation times square root of 2 pi. So we'll be off by a little bit, but for our initial guess, the amplitudes that we can read off of this plot are good enough. So I'm just going to put like 40 and I don't know, 130 for the second one. I think that's fair. And then we're also going to pass the wavelength centers. So we'll just use the spec peaks location that we just found with our find peaks function. 
I'm just gonna copy subway stuff peeps and paste it in here, and then I need to unpack it with the asterisks. Okay, and then lastly, we need to give it uh, an initial guess for the standard deviation and for the continuum of the spectrum. I'm gonna guess that the standard deviation is somewhere around five. That might be off by a little bit, but we'll see how that does. And then the continuum level, maybe close to four is probably an okay guess. Okay, so then let's try and run this and see if it actually can fit a pair of Gaussians to these emission lines. Okay, so this looks pretty good. Again, like I said, the amplitude is not exactly what we would read off of a plot, and that's because it's being divided by the standard deviation times some factor of square root of 2 pi. And then it looks like the continuum level was about 4.5. Line width is about 4.5. Um, amplitudes are 1150 and 375. And then our two wavelengths, which is what we need to get our redshift. Right, so it says that the oxygen 34959 emission line has been shifted to 6494. And the 5006 or 5007 uh, emission line is at 6557.6. So we can try and calculate the redshift now using these shifted wave centers. As it implies in the name, the 4959 emission line lies at about 4959 angstroms. So we'll call this 4959. This is the emitted wavelength. And the actual wavelength is 4958. Point nine one, uh, and then for the other line, I usually just refer to it as the five double oh seven line. And it's the emitted one, uh, but the actual wavelength is five zero zero six point eight four three. Okay, and then remember that our get redshift function requires that we give it the observed wavelength and the emitted one. So we're going to try and use that function to calculate the redshift for each of these lines. And they should match pretty well. So for the first one, source redshift is going to come from get redshift. And we want to pass it the observed line, which is our popped T. The second or third parameter, but the index equal I equals 2. And then we also want to pass it the emitted wavelength from the rest frame. Then we're going to print source redshift. Let's call this source redshift one since it's the first line. And then we'll do the same thing for the 5006 line. Okay. Equals get redshift. And we're going to give it the optimal parameter. This time it is the i equals 3 parameter. And then also the observed, or the admitted, excuse me, wavelength. And then again, print that and see how they compare side by side. Okay. So using our get redshift function, it looks like the redshift of this source is at z equals 0 0.309 with a bunch of numbers following that. Um, and it looks like they match pretty well up until the one, two, three, four, the fifth decimal. Right, so there's obviously some errors associated with both of these calculations, but I'm not going to go over error propagation or error analysis in this video. That's something you can look up on your own or Maybe we'll make another video focusing on that. So the SDSS profile webpage for this source also used this spectrum to get the spectroscopic information that they're displaying on that webpage. So we can actually compare what we calculated, the 0 0.309, to the answer that they got when they calculated the redshift to see how close we got. And so it looks like from their profile that, let's see, where is it? They got a spectroscopic redshift of 0 0.30949 with some error. 
which is pretty close to the answer that we got. So our fitting function did pretty well. I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm pleased with it. I think it did well enough. Some people need a more accurate estimate of the redshift, but for my purposes, this is perfect. Okay, so that's the end of this tutorial on using an observed spectrum of a galaxy to calculate the redshift of that galaxy. Hopefully this tutorial was useful to some of you. Let me know in the comments any, any feedback you have or any, any questions you have on this. And thank you all for watching.